So I'm seeing some right around 425-ish, around there. Um, cool, that's right about what I got, nice. <laughs> um, it's a little tricky to measure those, that circumference, but um, we can do our best with the images I gave you and get a pretty good idea of what the wind speeds are. And it was at least like pretty much in that range that um, we normally think the wind speeds in this red spot are. So much higher than the wind speeds on Earth. Um, and much, and the other thing that is interesting is that these winds have been going on for at least the past 200 years. So um, the storm has been going for a very long time, much faster than any, with winds much faster than what we see on storms on Earth. And that's partially because Jupiter doesn't have a solid surface. So on Earth, um, storms are slowed down when they uh, move over land and the friction between the air and the solid land will actually slow them down. And that's why we see um, hurricanes dissipate as they move over um, coastal cities. It's been a bad, <laughs> bad week for a lot of reasons, um, but Part of the reason we don't see storms dissipating on Jupiter and Saturn is that there is not a solid layer underneath them. And we can see just even outside of the red spot, um, wind speeds on Jupiter, and this is actually wind speeds on Saturn, get pretty incredibly high. So this is in meters per second, um, but we can see that depending on where you are, especially right around the equators on these planets, we get really high wind speeds. Um, so this was measured by Cassini um, and Voyager. Cassini was a spacecraft that was sent to Saturn in 1994 and reached Saturn in 2007. So it took 13 years to get to Saturn. So this is one of the reasons why we don't have as much data on these planets is if you've done the scale model um, solar system activity, you've noticed that the giant planets are really, really spaced out, so it's harder to get there. But when we do get things there, we get really cool data about what's happening, um, and we get to see that there are some crazy fast winds on these planets. Besides intense winds, um, both Jupiter and Saturn have incredibly strong magnetic fields. Um, so this is created by the metallic hydrogen cores that they both have. So Anything metal, when it's in motion, you get a magnetic field. Um, so the metallic hydrogen cores are rotating. They're rotating rather quickly. So we get these um, intense magnetic fields around Saturn and Jupiter. Um, So there, we can measure this uh, both by looking at uh, aurora that we see on both Saturn and Jupiter. So this is an image of the aurora on Jupiter. Um, and then we can also notice, we can look for um, radio, ra radio waves coming out uh, from these magnetic fields as charged particles that get um, from Io, one of Jupiter's moons, um, gets sucked into this magnetic field. So there's a uh, plasma torus going around Jupiter that comes from volcanic activity on Io, spitting out charged particles that get stuck in this magnetic field. Um, another little fun fact, if we could see, if we had eyes that could see magnetic fields, Jupiter's magnetic field would be as large as the full moon on the sky. Or no, sorry, it would be twice as large as the full moon on the sky. So if we could see Jupiter's magnetic field instead of Jupiter looking like a little point, it would look twice as large as the full moon, even though it is so much further away. So now to move on to Saturn. Saturn is pretty similar to Jupiter, but it has some differences. So I'm going to just highlight a few fun things about Saturn. Um, again, kind of similar to Jupiter. It does have a larger tilt, which might, um, so it has seasons, which might um, be why we don't see these sustained storms on Saturn like we do on Jupiter. We get temperature changes as we move through seasons, and that could cause a storm to dissipate. We're not 100% sure, um, but we do see on occasion white spot storms that get dissipated. So like the uh, image shown here, there are storms, but they dissipate with time on Saturn. 
Saturn is also pretty famous for having rings. Um, so all of the giant planets have rings, but Saturn's are the largest, the most visible. Um, we think that they're, we know that they're made of um, ice and rocks, but um, mostly ice, and that makes them very reflective on, of sunlight, so we can see them nicely. Uh, if you've ever seen Saturn through a telescope, you will be able to see its rings, which make it very pretty. Um, we think that these are materials that are just too close to Saturn to form a moon. So um, potentially material that would have formed a moon that gets broken up and you get rings instead because it's so close that it gets tidally pulled apart by Saturn. There also seem to be some sources that are refreshing the materials that make up the rings. So we're getting new ring material over time, which could indicate that, they, that some of this ring material is coming from comets or um, asteroids breaking up near Saturn. I said Saturn didn't have any long lasting storms, but it does have one, and that is the white hexagon on the North Pole of Saturn. Um, so this is a funky storm similar to the red spot, sort of, um, but, in first, but it's uh, hexagonal. So I've shown a few images of, of it here, and it's right above Saturn's North Pole. Um, we think the reason we can sustain this storm for so long, either Saturn can sustain this storm for so long, um, is because uh, there is a steep temperature gradient near the pole on Saturn. Uh, it's been visible for about 36 years, so we're not sure how long it's been there, but we know that it's at least been there for 36 years. Um, and the central hole, that little circle in the middle, is about 50 times bigger than eyes of storms on Earth. Um, mostly because Saturn is larger and its atmosphere is just more extreme. I got a question, why a hexagon? I don't think we fully know. Um, I think it has to do with those steep gradients, so just the way that the temperature falls off, we get a hexagon, but it's not completely um, understood. Uh, so that's a great question, on it. why a hexagon? So thanks, Cameron. Okay. So that's Jupiter and Saturn, a bit of an overview. Um, I didn't talk about their moons. They do both have a ton of moons, but I'm going to save those for um, one of our end of the year um, lectures, which will be about aliens. There's a lot of reasons to think the moons of Jupiter and Saturn might host life. So we will save those for then um, and have a fun talk about them then. Uh, so we're going to move on, sorry, uh, to Neptune and Uranus. Uh, both of them are, Neptune and Uranus are slush or ice giants. They are much smaller than, they're still very large, but they're much smaller than Jupiter and Saturn. Because they are so much smaller, they do not have that liquid metallic core um, because there is not enough mass pressing down to get pressure conditions that would form a liquid metallic core. So instead we see a cloud layer, then a gaseous hydrogen layer, and then a core made out of rocks, metal, water, methane, and ammonia on both of them. Neptune and Uranus are pretty similar to each other. They're both about the same size. They're made up of similar materials. They have similar atmospheres. Um, and we think that they're smaller than Jupiter and Saturn because they formed further from the sun. So, um, I'm not going to talk much about planet formation in this course because it's complicated and we're still learning a lot about it. But the idea is that um, when the sun formed, you got kind of the sun in the center and a disk of materials rotating around it. And that disk over time coalesces to form planets. So your planets form to be a size semi-proportional to the distance from the sun because there's just more stuff in a ring around the sun of that distance. So if you're really close to the sun, if you put a donut in, it'll be smaller, there'll be less stuff to stick together and form a planet. If you put a donut around the sun at the radius of Jupiter, it's a really big donut. So there's a lot of stuff that you can stick together to form your planet. Um, as you get out to Neptune and Uranus, there's still more stuff, but you're starting, your, your donut is bigger, but things are starting to get less dense. And you also don't move as far as our disk slowly dissipates. So they're moving slow enough, they don't sweep out everything in their donut as it dissipates, and um, things are less dense, so they just don't get as big. So it's kind of a hand-wavy version of planet formation, why Uranus and Neptune might be smaller than Jupiter and Saturn. Just some similar basic facts. Um, 
they're fairly similar, mostly hydrogen and helium with a methane atmosphere. Um, they have similar densities, kind of similar to Jupiter, so lower than what we would think of for rocks, which tells us that they can't be solid for the most part, they need to be gaseous. They're both about four times the size of Earth, or four times the size of Earth in terms of radii, and um, 15 to 20 times the size of Earth in terms of mass. Again, surface gravity is a little weird to think about on these planets where they might not actually have a surface, um, but they would be fairly similar to Earth, um, with Uranus being slightly less than gravity on Earth because its um, radius is much larger, but its mass isn't much larger. So or its mass is larger, but not proportionally um, with the radius. And we can remember that we can find surface gravity by dividing mass by radius squared. So 15 divided by about four squared would be 15 over 16, close to one, but not quite, slightly less than one. Um, you could do the same thing with Neptune, but it's a little more tricky because of the decimal points. Uranus has the really funky tilt. So I think that's my next slide. Nope, that's not my next slide. So we'll get to that. We'll talk about seasons on Uranus in a second. Sorry. Um, neither of them really have much of an eccentricity. Um, and days are, again, shorter than days on Earth, but longer than days on Saturn and Jupiter. So they're rotating fairly quickly, but not as fast as Jupiter and Saturn. Both of them are blue because of methane in their atmosphere. So methane absorbs red light really well and scatters blue light, which is similar to what we're seeing um, in our own atmosphere. When you know, there's not smoke in the sky and you see a blue sky, it's because um, blue light is getting scattered by our atmosphere, while as yellow light passes through and the sun puts out a lot of um, yellow light. Um, but it also puts out blue light. So the blue light that the sun puts out gets scattered through the atmosphere, making the sky look blue. Uh, Uranus is slightly lighter blue than Neptune. We don't know why. Um, there haven't been any um, satellites put into orbit around Neptune and Uranus, so everything we know about them is from Voyager passing by and moving on into the outer solar system. So we know even less about Neptune and Uranus than we do about Jupiter and Saturn. They do have some storms in these dark spots. Um, both of them have some. Uh, they also have white clouds made of frozen methane around the dark spots. So we think maybe um, some form of storm. Uh, the little white spot down here is named Jupiter, if you're curious. Um, and in terms of just wind speed, the fastest winds in the solar system were recorded on Neptune, where there were winds that reached 1,500 miles per hour. So um, Neptune has the fastest winds, even faster than what we measured on Jupiter and Saturn. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is, that last image was uh, Neptune. This is Jupiter. We can see it does have a dark spot, but it's hard to see. These are images taken with Hubble, so a space telescope, and they're still fairly fuzzy because it is so far away. So like I said, um, Neptune has some pretty crazy seasons. Uh, a lot of you heard about this in the reading quiz for today, where because Neptune, or Uranus, sorry, Uranus has crazy seasons, sorry, um, because it has an axial tilt of almost 90 degrees. So it is rotating on its side. So it's spinning around like this. It's my attempt, it's hard to do. Um, I can't float. Uh, unfortunately. So what that means is that if you are on the north pole of Uranus, you will have 42 years of solid sunlight followed by 42 years of darkness. So you'll have one day, sort of, that lasts 42 years, and then you'll have one night that lasts 42 years because of this extreme tilt. So if we remember, seasons are caused by tilts. When we get a tilt of about 90 degrees, our seasons become pretty insane. Um, so on Earth, we have 23.5 degrees. 90 is all the way on its side. Um, we're not really sure why it's this tilted. Potentially something bumped into it and knocked it on its side. Uh, in astronomy, if we don't know why something is the way it is, we often throw a collision at it. So eh, maybe 
maybe there was a collision, um, but we don't really know. I'm going to take a little side trip through history to talk about the discovery of Neptune because it's pretty cool. Um, so back um, in the 1800s, I think I didn't put a date in, that was a mistake. Um, Alexei Bouvier uh, noticed perturbations in Uranus's orbit. So he noticed that Uranus wasn't following nice Keplerian motion. So its orbit wasn't an ellipse like we would think. Um, it's slightly not an ellipse. And so he used that uh, to say maybe there might be another planet outside of Uranus's orbit that is gravitationally tugging on it, causing its orbit to change over time. Urbain Le Verrier used this to determine the position of this eighth planet within one degree. So that's pretty small on the sky. Your thumb is about half a degree. If you hold it out, the moon is about half a degree. So he was able to say, there should be an eighth planet and it needs to be right there based on the gravitational effects it had on Uranus. Um, this planet was called, they were able to find it then because we knew where to paint it. We were able to look right where Neptune should be and we saw there was an eighth planet there and it was Neptune. This method is currently being used to hunt for a planet called Planet Nine. Um, so this would be outside um, a larger radius than Uranus and Neptune and Pluto, something large, massive out there that seems to maybe be causing some of the dwarf planets in our solar system to have pretty crazy orbits. So they might be being tugged on something massive outside that might be a ninth planet. Whether or not it's actually there, we're not really sure, but this idea gets thrown out on occasion that there is a planet nine somewhere out there. Um, we talked a little bit about Saturn's rings, but all four of the giant planets have some amount of rings. Saturn's are just the largest and the most visible. Um, we think this is material that could have formed into a moon, but was too close, and so it gets tidally pulled apart and isn't able to coalesce and form an actual moon. Um, some scientists are able to use moons to think about how, um, or use the rings to think about how uh, protoplanets might have formed as well. So these could also be planets that would have formed but just didn't um, because there wasn't enough material. Uh, the other thing to point out, I didn't say this, but um, Saturn's rings are very, very wide, but they are really, really thin. So if you wanted to make a sheet of paper to be Saturn's rings and you wanted it to be to scale, so they had the thickness of the sheet of paper, they would need that sheet of paper would need to be like over a mile long. So um, there are thousands of kilometers, they're about a thousand of kilometer wide, but they're only a few meters thick. So very, very, very thin. Okay. Um, to wrap up our solar system, we're gonna talk very briefly about Pluto. Um, Pluto is not a planet, it is a dwarf planet. Um, and I will talk about what that means in a second. Uh, it's smaller than Earth, closer in size to the moon. Um, its average distance to the sun is about 40 AU, so 40 times the distance um, from Earth to the sun. Uh, its orbit is very eccentric compared to the other planets um, at 0.24. So Mercury also has that eccentric orbit, but this is pretty weird. Um, and because it has an axial tilt of over 90 degrees, it is also rotating backwards, similar to Venus. Uh, we recently got really nice images from New Horizons, so we have some idea about what's happening on um, Pluto into, on Pluto's surface more than we did even just a few uh, years ago. This is a joke comic from XKCD of what's actually there, but some of it's real. So like I said, Pluto is a dwarf planet. This category was initially created because we started, Pluto was the first dwarf planet we found, but since then we found a large number of similar objects that are often on similar orbits to Pluto, but very, very small. And so there was kind of a discussion about what a planet actually was. Um, and what they decided was that 
Pluto was not, did not um, meet the criteria to be a planet and is instead a dwarf planet. So we're going to just move through um, that since we're running out of time and I do want to talk about this briefly. Um, but the definition of a planet according to the um, International Astro Astronomical Union or the IAU is that it is a celestial body that is in orbit around the sun, number one. So, so far Pluto fits that. B, it has sufficient mass for gravity to overcome rigid body forces so that it assumes a hydrostatic equilibrium, nearly round shape. So what that means is that it has enough mass that it has kind of turned into a sphere. So the moons of Mars would not meet this criteria. They are not massive enough to have become spheres. They're potato shaped. Um, Pluto is massive enough to look like a sphere. So, so far it's two for two. Um, but number three, this is where we have a problem. Um, we define a planet as something that has cleared the area around its orbit. So we need, the pl a planet has to be gravitationally in charge of its orbit and Pluto's orbit crosses Neptune's. So we can see here, this is the orbital path of Pluto and there are parts where it is actually inside the orbital path of Neptune. So there's times where Pluto is closer to the sun than Neptune is and there's times where it's further away. So this means gravitationally, it is not in charge of its orbit um, all the time. There is something larger that is on a similar orbit as Pluto, so it does not meet the criteria to be a planet. Eris is another dwarf planet. It's actually larger than Pluto, and we can see that it has a similar thing where it crosses Neptune's orbit as well as Pluto, so it's not necessarily gravitation. It hasn't cleared its orbit. There are other things in the orbit of Eris, making it a dwarf planet instead of an actual planet. A um, little fun fact, um, if you go to New Mexico, it is still a planet because they voted on it and they decided it was a planet. Um, but according to astronomers, it's a dwarf planet. Um, so there's quite a few dwarf planets have been discovered since the discovery of Pluto. Um, there's Eris, there's Maki Maki, um, there's Sedna, I can say Sedna, um, some of these other ones have names that I can't quite pronounce. Uh, a few of the dwarf planets have their own moons, so Eris has dysnomia. Pluto has quite a few moons with one big one, Charon, which is about not that different in size from Pluto, um, as well as a few other smaller guys, Nix, Styx, Cerberus, and Hydra. Um, Kind of a fun fact uh, about Pluto is how it was discovered. So um, Percival Lowell was a famous astronomer working back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and he was pretty sure that he had found perturbations in Neptune's orbit, suggesting that there was a planet outside of Neptune's orbit, um, similar to what was uh, how they discovered Neptune. He was wrong. Um, Neptune's orbit is fine, there's nothing disturbing it, um, but his measurements sent everyone looking for a ninth planet, and Clyde Tomba um, was able to somehow um, point his telescope in the right direction and find Pluto. So gravity from Pluto could not have caused the um, perturbations that per Percival Lowell measured, but by luck and based on this search, Clyde Tomba was able to find Pluto. Pluto has a very thin atmosphere that's mostly made up of nitrogen and a little bit of methane. If you've done the um, planetary atmospheres um, lab, you will have seen this because Pluto is very cold. It can sustain a bit of an atmosphere. Um, even though it is really not very massive and doesn't have much gravity. Um, from New Horizons, we've gotten some images of the surface of Pluto. Uh, the red areas are tholins, and then there's also, which are um, methane and ethane molecules that have been exposed to UV radiation. Uh, the surface of Tholins is the surface of Pluto is mostly ice with some of this red Tholin material on top. So Pluto is made of water, ice, and this kind of frozen methane and ethane. Um, 
The heart-shaped area is called the Krun Makala, and it rises 1.5 miles above the rest of the surrounding plains, um, which are, have been named the Sputnik Planum. So we're learning a lot about Pluto's atmosphere very recently because New Horizons went by allowing us to get actual images of it when before it just was kind of a fuzzy pixel um, in most images that we had. And that has shown us that there are some interesting um, formations on the surface, not that we don't fully understand as of yet. So there's just some kind of funky um, patterns that we don't completely know how they formed. Like this pockmarked surface. And there's some craters and we can see the splits along the craters um, show that maybe there's ices and potentially water underneath those ices. Um, but uh, we don't completely know yet. And just to say that again with the planet nine, I think this is where we will probably wrap up. Um, we've found a lot of these dwarf planets have um, orbits that are very eccentric in the same direction. So these little circles in here are the orbits of Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. These are all um, orbits of measured dwarf planets. And so the idea is this dotted line could be um, the orbit of a massive planet nine that would be 400 to 1,500 times um, further from the sun than Earth, making it very difficult to detect because planets don't put out a ton of light, especially if they're really far from the sun. So um, all of these dwarf planets have been called sednoids because they follow similar orbits as Sedna. Um, they could be gravitationally pulled on by this planet nine that we have yet to detect, but we don't. We haven't detected it yet. So we don't know if it's there. Um, so that's basically our solar system. Oh, call it good there. Um, next week on Tuesday, we have our tests. So there will not be class. I will be on the Zoom link if you want to come and ask me questions. I will also be available on Wednesday in office hours and just by email if you have questions about the test. Um, all of your homework class participation points need to be submitted um, before your test to get to have them count. So your last thing that you need to do is just give me a little short paragraph explanation about whether or not you think Pluto should still be called a planet. Um, and it can be just, I think Pluto should be a planet because I like Pluto. That can be good enough. Um, but it's whatever you think, I wanna know where our class stands so I can let you guys know on Thursday after the test. Um, please feel free to shoot me any questions that you have and have a good weekend and good luck. Um, you all will do fine. It's going to be fine. <laughs> um, where do we write our response to Pluto? Where do we post that? So that's in your assignment seven. It should just, there should be a text file you can upload. Oh, okay. Or a text box. <laughs>